love Christmas. But I can't say that it always brought out the best in me as a kid. Let's just say that I knew what I liked and I knew what I didn't like. And what I liked were opening presents that had toys inside. And what I didn't like was opening presents with clothes inside. <laughs> you chuckle. But you may think to yourself, I was kind of like that too. But if you had to relive yourself being that way through the magic of home video recording, yeah. So, uh, so you know, my family, we love going back and watching old home movies. Like, we like to see kind of how things were. And, you know, today with phones, you know, we record just little bits of things. We get little kind of like cute snippets or little funny things that are happening. But back then, if you were going to record a home video, you were like in it for the long haul, right? Like, you had to set it up, and you just pushed record, and you were just going to get what you were going to get. And so as my family would go back and look at old videos, you know, I mean, just hours of wasted footage that you got to fast forward through to get the occasional gem, right, where you were really happy that you had the camera on. Well, one of my family's greatest hits was a Christmas morning whenever I was a kid. And I had just opened a present with clothes in it, and I went in to full-on brat mode. I thought I said I didn't want any clothes. And I mean, so you get to see me throw this little tantrum, which is just so fun. And my parents shut it down real quick because they weren't having that. And so they scolded me and they sent me to my room on Christmas on video <laughs> forever. <laughs> so my family, we go back and we watch this and we laugh about it, but honestly, it's, it's excruciating for me to watch. <laughs> like I get this, this knot in the pit of my stomach every time, just looking at myself being so ungrateful. So we're in this series we have been through the month of December. It's called The Christmas Gift. And we have been talking through and, and really trying to grow in our gratefulness for the gift that we have received in Jesus, the one that we celebrate at this time of year. We've been talking about different aspects of, of who Jesus was, who Jesus came to be, so that we can grow in our thankfulness to God for sending him. And having a better understanding of why we needed him, we will all be a little bit more thankful. And that framework, that, that framework of the giving of a gift from a parent to a child, it's actually a really good framework for us to think through when we think about God's gift of Jesus to us. God, as the devoted parent, giving Jesus to us, his children. Because you see, a parent, they're going to get you gifts that are different than what maybe a friend would get you or what maybe another family member would get you. A parent is going to get you something that you need. They're going to get you something that they know because they know you better than any of those other people, something that's going to help you thrive. And if we can be real with each other for a minute, I think a lot of us have probably had, well, I don't want any clothes moments when it comes to the gift of Jesus. That Jesus was maybe the gift that we needed, but he wasn't exactly the gift that we wanted to open. You know, we've been talking about these different aspects, these gifts that we've put under the tree. You know, God, he, he gave us his love in sending his son to us, but I'd kind of rather have had that promotion at work. God, he, 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 he ushered in, Jesus ushered in this, this perfect kingdom of righteousness and justice, but I really wanted him to bring me into a relationship with that person. Jesus is this gift of wisdom and guidance for my life, and he does it in such a gracious way. But what I wanted was for him to heal that person who didn't get better. Now here's the thing. No one's getting scolded or sent to their room for asking God for good gifts, for wanting the good things that he gives. Promotions, relationships, healings, those are all good things. My parents weren't upset at me for desiring something that would make me happy. 
but they knew that they needed to cultivate in me a gratitude for something that I needed. And God, as this devoted parent, he knows what we need better than we ever could. And so we're seeking to grow in our gratefulness to him together. We've been using Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7 as sort of our jumping off point for this series. As a prophet, Isaiah, he spoke a lot about who Jesus would be because the people in his day were still anticipating his coming. Isaiah 9, we're just going to read verse 6 this morning, says this, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. This morning we're going to unpack that phrase, everlasting father. And this is one that honestly, it was was one of the tougher parts of Isaiah's prophecy for me to start to wrap my head around. One of the things I love about the Bible is that the Bible is something that is so accessible. You can be brand new to it, you can be brand new to faith, not really know much about it, and you can go to the Bible and you can read it, and you can learn, and you can understand But it's also really deep. It's so deep that even the most seasoned believers, the people who have been reading it the longest, still can comb its depths and can learn and can grow. Well, this morning, this morning, we need to go into one of the deeper things. And, you know, it's one of the reasons why I think that every pool should have a shallow end and a deep end. (laughs) Because it's fun for everybody. It's fun to be able to have a place where you can put your feet down. And and it's fun to be able to have a place where you can go and and get a little deeper and actually swim. And, you know, there's the added bonus for me as a parent that it keeps your parenting instincts sharp. You know, when your kid goes running towards that deep end at full speed with no flotation device. Right? (laughs) Keeps you on it. This morning I'm going to invite you to wade into one of the deeper things with me. And we're going to go there together, and, and I haven't lost one of my kids in the deep end of a pool yet, you know, and, and I promise that I'm going to do my best not to lose any of us as we go into the deep together, all right? All right, so in our faith, in our faith, we believe in something that you may have heard of called the Trinity. Trinity is not a word that you're going to find anywhere in the Bible, but it's a word that Christians have been using for a very, very long time to sort of encompass, to sort of describe this complex idea that the Bible teaches about God. We worship one God. Ever since the the time of the Old Testament, the beginnings of the Jewish religion, they were marked by their worship of the one God true God, even when they were surrounded by cultures that worshipped multiple gods. And as God brought that faith to culmination through Jesus Christ, we as his followers, we have continued into today to worship the one true God. We worship one God. That part's simple. Here's where it gets more complex. We believe, and the Bible teaches, that that God exists, that one God exists as three. In titles that the Bible designates, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They are all equally God. No one of them is more God than another. They are not three separate gods. They are all together one God. If it hurts your head thinking about it a little bit, like you are in good company, Christians have been wrestling with this one for thousands of years. It is this divine mystery that we just can't fully explain. In fact, most of our attempts to explain this mystery go wrong somewhere. Any analogy that we come up with to try to explain the Trinity, it falls short in some way. And, you know, if one were inclined to be obnoxious, they, may, they might carry around a buzzer. We'll call it their, their heresy buzzer. And anytime someone tried to, you know, give an analogy to describe the Trinity, they would probably just, you know, give you one, give you one of these. They'd just give you a little buzz, you know. Uh, you know, God, God is, 
God's kind of like water, you know, where water has solid, liquid, and, and gas. Nope. <laughs> That's not how God is because solid, liquid, and gas are different phases of water. God is Father, Son, Holy Spirit all at the same time. Well, you know, God, he's a, God is like an, an apple. You know how an apple has like the skin, like the outside part, and it has the core, and it has the seed? Nope! Because you see, those are parts of an apple. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they are not parts of God. They are all completely God. Well, well you know, God is kind of like, just no, no, mm -mm. It was going to be wrong, whatever it was. <laughs> it's obnoxious, right? <laughs> you see, it's a mystery. It's something that we cannot fully explain, but we trust in it. And we even delight in it for reasons that I hope you'll see as we continue on today. Look with me at the book of John, chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. See, John was one of Jesus' closest followers, one of his closest disciples, but John took the longest to write his book, to write his account of Jesus' ministry. He spent decades just processing what it is that he had learned from and about Jesus, and we believe that God the Holy Spirit inspired him, spoke through him to write it to us this way. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word is a title that John uses for Jesus. We see that definitively a little later in chapter 1, which we'll get to in a bit. But he says that he was with God, separate, and that he was God, unity, at the same time. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. So, God the Father is a Trinitarian title. It is a title that describes one person of the Trinity, one distinct person, the Father. The Son, who is the Word, who is Jesus, is not the Father. And yet, with the Father and the Spirit is together one God. So why would Isaiah be prophesying Jesus to be the everlasting Father? It wasn't that Isaiah was confusing these members of the Trinity, getting mixed up between the Father and the Son. In fact, to the best of our knowledge, an Old Testament prophet, the idea of a Trinity, it wouldn't have even been on his radar. You see, Isaiah was using the term Father in a different sense. If you've been with us in any of the messages in this series, and if you haven't, we put them all up online. We invite you to go and check them out and catch up. But if you have been with us, you know that Isaiah, he was, he was prophesying, he was foretelling the coming of someone who would be a ruler, somebody who would be a king. And so Isaiah, when he's using this word father, he is, he's referring to something that people in their nations back then, they viewed their kings as national fathers, and this isn't a foreign concept to those of us who have maybe grown up or been around the United States for a while. You know, we think of our founding fathers. We think of these individuals who were responsible for coming up with many of the ideas and the, and the structures and the, and, the, and the systems that became what, be, what became our country. And so in Isaiah's day, they looked to their leaders as sort of a national father. They looked to this person to protect them and to provide for them and to really just sort of encompass everything that they desired to be as, an, as a nation. What Isaiah was telling us is that Jesus was going to be a father-like figure to us all. But it goes even a step further than that, and leaning into this Trinity conversation that we've been having, we haven't been talking about it for no reason, 
You know, that Jesus has this interaction with his disciples in John chapter 14, verses 7 through 10. He says to them, If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip, this is one of Jesus' followers, his disciples, Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Like, just a little thing, you know. <laughs> show us God. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. You see, not only is Jesus a Father-like figure to us all, whatever there is for us to know about God, our Heavenly Father, we see in Jesus. He is the perfect picture of our Father God. Colossians 1 says that he is the image of the invisible God. Hebrews 1 calls him the exact representation of God's being. You see, Jesus is the gift that embodies the devoted parent. Jesus is the gift that embodies the devoted parent. Now, at this point, I just want to stop because where the rest of our message takes us today, the text that we're going to be walking in, I just feel like there's, there's something we need to talk about. Christmas this season, it's a time of joy, and it should be, but not everybody going through the Christmas season is always feeling just joy associated with it. And so I don't, I don't do this often, and participation is not mandatory. If for you, Christmas is a season of joy that's also mixed with some grieving, would you just, would you just raise your hand? I don't, I don't do that to make anybody like have to feel any extra sadness. I do it because we're a church and in church you need to know that you're not alone. And grieving is one of the loneliest feelings that there is. Um, as we go on in this conversation about parents, I know that there are some in the room who this time of year makes them miss parents that aren't here anymore. My mom sent me a box of cookies this week and I lost it. Like. <laughs> let alone if I couldn't talk to her, couldn't. There are others among us. There are others among us who never had a relationship with the parent that we wanted to have or felt like we should have had. Maybe parents who weren't there for us emotionally. Maybe parents who were just gone, just absentee. And we see these other people getting together for these holiday reunions, times where they're spending time together, and... All we can think of is that when I get together with my family, it's going to be brokenness and it's going to be hurt and it's going to bring up all of this old stuff. So before we keep walking forward today, I just want to say a prayer to God who is the God of all comfort and peace to be with us now. Let's pray. Father God, you, you tell us to call you Father. You tell us to call you Dad. And Lord, for some of us, that's, that's a hard thing to do. God, we thank you, Lord, for being the God of comfort and peace. We thank you, Lord, that we can learn more about that from your word. And God, I do just pray a prayer of comfort over every one of us who is here in the room or listening today. God, be with us. Let us feel you near. It's in your name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. Jesus is the gift that embodies the devoted parent. And sometimes our earthly parents make that a lot easier to understand, and sometimes they make it a lot harder. Um, 
as the everlasting father, Jesus is the representation of everything that good parents are trying to be and everything that poor parents should have been. And this is something that he is devoted to for the long haul. He's called the everlasting father. Unlike some of you who maybe have an experience of a parent being gone from your lives, like Jesus is committed to being with you for the long haul. There are so many different ways that we can see how Jesus embodies the devoted parent. That if we were going to talk about all of them, honestly, we would probably be here until Christmas Eve. <laughs> so we've got to focus on in in some way. And since God's word already has us in John chapter 1, I thought it would be healthy for us to stay there. If you would, you can look down at John chapter 1 verse 14. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. That's, that's Jesus, remember the word. Th this is basically John's whole Christmas story just in a sentence. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father full of grace and truth. And it's those two words that I want to narrow in on this morning as we talk about Jesus' embodiment of the devoted parent. Grace and truth. See, they aren't the only things that make a devoted parent, but they're two pretty important qualities. You know, I'm fortunate. I'm fortunate to have a good relationship with my dad, and my parents are not perfect, but um, I, I got pretty good ones. And, um, you know, uh, I'm going to tell you about two interactions, just kind of brief stories, but I want to tell you two different stories about interactions with my dad when I was a teenager. I feel like teenagers is a good time to pull from because that's when you and your parents are, you know, usually maybe in the most conflict. So the first story is this. Uh, my dad drove a big green Chevy truck. I mean, just a boat of a vehicle. And one day I was, I was driving his truck and I had to take it downtown and I had to park in a parking garage. And as we all know, parking garages were just designed for compact cars, right? So anyway, as I was leaving this parking garage, I, I, I misestimated the, the, the wideness of the turn that I needed to take getting out of the parking garage. And there was this, there was this tall yellow pole there um, that just played Morse code on the side of my dad's truck. Just did it, did it, did it, I mean, scratched and dented it all the way down. And I thought he was going to kill me. <laughs> So I got home, and I went, and I got him, and I showed him. And I remember he stood there, and he looked at it, and he nodded his head, and he said, well, I'm glad you're okay. He didn't yell at me for being careless. He didn't make me feel bad. He didn't tell me how much he was going to have to pay to fix it. In fact, to my recollection, he has never once brought up that accident to me ever again. Not even in conversation, let alone to make me feel guilty about it. Second story. When I was a teenager, I decided that there was an extracurricular activity that I had been involved in that I would... I, w I was ready to be done with. I was going to no longer be involved with it. Y you could use the word quit. I won't use the word quit, but you could use the word quit if you want. Um, I decided I wasn't going to do this anymore, but this was an activity that my parents had invested a, a good amount of time and money into me doing. So whenever I went and told them, you know, I, I don't want to do this anymore, I'm not going to do this anymore, I told them that I think I would take that time um, that I had been doing it and that I would get my first job. They liked that idea. And it had been like maybe a month, and I think I had applied for one job. And, you know, any time that they asked, I would say, well, you know, I'm, I'm waiting to hear back. And finally, my dad sat me down, and he looked me in the eye. And he said, son, you need to work a little harder at finding work. This is what you told us you were going to do. You need to be a man of your word. You committed to doing this. So you need to get out there today and go find a job, find a place to work. And I, it doesn't matter if it's not your first or your second choice. <coughs> now, in which of those two stories was my dad a better parent? Which, which one did he love me more? 
both. Both of those stories are really good examples of a father loving his son well. In the story of, uh, with the truck, he showed me grace. He was the human embodiment of grace to me in that moment. In the story about the job, he spoke truth into my life. He, he challenged me to step it up and to be a man of my word and to do what I said I was going to do. A devoted parent is one that is full of grace and truth. If a parent is all grace, you may feel like you have a good relationship with them, but they never hold you accountable for anything. You get away with bad behavior, you're never corrected on your poor decision making, and you aren't prepared for real life that has real consequences. If a parent is all truth, then you can never do good enough. You can never be good enough. You will fall short again and again and again until eventually the relationship is strained at best and just as likely broken. Jesus came as the complete representation of God the Father, full of grace and truth. He came to tell us the truth. He loved us enough to tell us the truth because sin has you lost. He wasn't afraid to call a sin, sin. If you disobeyed God's will, it wasn't something to be ignored. It wasn't something to be treated like it was no big deal because the end result is eternal separation from God, which is a very, very long time. He loved us enough to tell us that truth. He loved us enough to tell us the truth that he was the only way to God, that no one can come to the Father except through the Son, who is the perfect embodiment of the Father. He loves us in truth, and he desires that no one should perish. And Jesus is grace personified. He didn't wait for us to get ourselves cleaned up and somehow make ourselves worthy of him. He came to us right in our mess to clean us up, to do for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. He stepped into the lives of those who the quote-unquote good people of his day wouldn't have given the time of day. He stepped into their lives, into our lives, and he valued us, and he loved us, and he embraced us. And he called us into deeper relationship with him. One that wouldn't leave us where we were. The fullness of grace and truth was then put on display on the cross. It was a picture of both grace and truth. It was the truth of God that he is holy, that he is sinless, and that sin deserves to be punished. Sin is an offense to a perfect God. And he poured out that truth and that punishment on the cross, but not on us, on himself. God the Son, in a willing commitment relationship with God the Father, taking that punishment on himself, which is why the cross is also a perfect picture of grace. That God loved us so much that he would pour out wrath on himself, take the penalty on himself to save us from it. Jesus is the gift that embodies the devoted parent. One that would sacrifice their very self in an act of grace and truth to draw us closer to him. Come with me one more time to John chapter 1, this time verses 10 through 13. He, Jesus, was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. 
If God is our Father and Jesus is the embodiment of that Father-like figure for us, then what does that make us, those who believe in His name? God's children. And there's confidence that comes in that. If you are, if you're missing a parent this holiday season, the love and the guidance of a parent, or if you never experienced it the way that you should have, Jesus represents the eternal Father. A Father for all eternity with all of the love and the guidance that you need. And it's a gift for us and it's one that some of us could sorely use today. You see, some of us have been shown in our lives too much truth without grace. Maybe from a parent, maybe from the world. We could never do enough. We could never quite live up to their expectations. And if that's you, you need to know this. You have a father who loves you, and it has nothing to do with the things that you do. It is about who you are. My kids fall short of my expectations for them daily. And never once have I even considered loving them less and not calling them my own. God loves you. You are his child, even when you fail to be perfect or far from it. You can live in that confidence. You don't have to walk in a guilt that your loving father is not putting on you if you have received the name of Jesus. Now, there are others among us who may have received all grace and no truth. Maybe from parents, maybe from the world. And to those of you who look in the mirror and you don't like what you see, you see someone who makes bad choices, who can't seem to get it right, and who gets bit by the consequences time and time again, God, in a loving way, has truth to speak into your life. He wants to give you a good path to walk, a path that leads to Him, that leads to eternal life. Jesus is the gift that I pray we'll all receive. He is the model of a parent that the best parents just show us glimpses of and that the worst parents fall woefully short of. Have you received him? Today would be a good day. And while we worship and while we reflect on God's truth, it would be good for you to turn to the person who invited you to come and just say, can you tell me about the hope that you have in Jesus? And if you don't have that person, maybe you came on your own, then while we worship, I'm going to be in the back of the room, and I would love to have a conversation with you about what it means to experience the grace and truth of Jesus Christ. And so we're all going to stand. We're going to worship together. Our God who loves us so much in this perfect embodiment that we see through Christ Jesus our Lord.